I'm very thankful for On One Software and for Brian for allowing me to give this presentation and, and for all of you joining from all around the world. Um, you know, uh, photography is certainly a huge passion of mine and I really enjoy sharing um, all sorts of aspects um, of it. So I'm really excited to give my presentation today. Um, and when Brian first talked to me, um, you know, we came up with an idea for this On One Presents and we wanted to have a little bit more of a focus, as he mentioned, on the business side of photography. And it's something that's vitally important. So as I'm going through my presentation, uh, there's going to be a lot of aesthetic um, background images, which are a lot of the images that I've shot over the years um, that might not necessarily pertain to a specific topic that we're talking on, but just showcase more of the work that I'm doing um, kind of all over the globe um, and whatnot. So um, with that, I kind of wanted to start and, and give you a little bit more background, as Brian mentioned, about myself. Um, I'm a Denver, uh, Colorado-based photographer. I've been doing this for eight years. Um, I actually didn't teach myself. All right, I did teach myself, sorry. Um, I didn't go to school for photography, so um, I learned pretty much everything that I learned by making mistakes, and I think that's really helped shape not only my view of photography in the industry, but also my business practices and, and kind of um, really helped uh, allow me to create my life um, as, as I've done so far. Um, over the years, I've been really, really fortunate to be able to travel kind of all over the world, and I've been uh, lucky enough to have worked with amazing companies like National Geographic, um, teaching photography for them in Ecuador for a few months, um, to doing work with the Sierra Club. Um, I also happen to uh, do some writing on the side, um, usually articles and periodicals in conjunction um, with different trips that I do, and, and I'll go a little bit more into that here in a second. Um, what I wanted to actually start off with um, was telling a story, and, and I think this is a, a good foray into the business of photography. It's kind of the first photography um, job that I ever got that was actually paying, uh, and I want to give a little bit of backstory, and I'm actually going to share while I'm doing this a few of my images um, that I first started taking out. Um, uh, these are actually images of, of myself around the world. Sorry, this is Nepal. Uh, this is actually when I was working in Vietnam. Uh, I was trying to trying to avoid buying more bracelets, as you can see, I already had about 10 on. Um, this is me working in Grand Teton National, Ball, uh, National Park. This is, a, again, Nepal. This is about 19,000 feet, um, and I'll talk more about that a little bit later as well. It's one of my favorite countries in the world. Um, Lake Tahoe, Guatemala, uh, more in the, uh, in the Hindu Kush. Haiti, um, as Brian mentioned, I, I started a foundation last year. It's not even a foundation, it's an organization that is a support service for local NGOs on the ground by providing them free photography, videography, and um, web services in order to help them connect with their donors. Um, that's not necessarily something I'll, I'll be talking about in the presentation, but it's something that I'm very passionate about. If you get a chance, please do check out the link that I put in the chat, uh, chat menu because it's um, uh, Haiti's an amazing country, and, and unfortunately, in today's time, uh, the, the attention span of, of the general public um, tends to um, be very short-lived. So hopefully through some of the work that I'm doing and then through some of the organizations, it brings the light back on, on these, uh, this amazing culture and these amazing people. Um, yeah, so, so this image is actually, I, I do a lot of behind-the-scenes work and, and part of my photo education piece um, that I only teach workshops, I also uh, try to do as much as I can, um, you know, for free or helping out other photographers. I think that's vitally important. And, and, and again, I will get to that a little bit later, but this is just a behind the scenes shot that I did in Patagonia last year, um, showcasing some of the amazing light out there and um, uh, sharing my, my wealth of knowledge um, about this type of uh, photography or nature landscape, which is, is my true passion. Um, another shot of Patagonia, more Patagonia, uh, and then this finally brings us to where, where I want it to be. Um, so. When I first started out doing photography, um, as I mentioned, I didn't study it in school, so I I knew that I loved traveling, and and like many people out there, you know, I, I had a very um, fantasized uh, or, or romanticized, maybe more more accurately, uh, ideology of, of what it would take in order for me to travel. So when I when I graduated from from college, um, I. I graduated in emergency administration and planning, which is, you know, disaster scenarios and, and develop, undeveloped countries and whatnot, which actually is coming to practice, but I got an 8 to 5 job and I wore a suit and tie and worked in an office and really could not stand it. Um, you know, it lasted for about six months, which is longer than I thought it was going to. Um, and I, I sold everything that 
um, that I had, and I had saved up a, a decent amount of money, and I actually moved up to Vancouver, Canada. So at the time, I graduated from uh, school in Dallas, Texas. And when I got up there, I I was thinking about what you know, what kind of ways could I um, kind of figure out how to travel for a living. And you know, just like a, a little kid, and you know, when I was a teenager, I wanted to work for National Geographic and do all these things, but but I had no idea what I was doing. I, I didn't have any sense of the business side of photography yet. I honestly had never had a digital, you know, a, a professional uh, digital SLR camera. Um, I, I used Kodak cameras in the past, right when digital started coming out, just because my parents had happened to share some with me. And it became a, a logical conclusion that you know, photography seems to allow to get people to travel. So in my naive sense, I, I, I bought a camera. It was actually a Canon XDI. Um, I, I bought a bunch of books. Um, this was, again, while I was living up in Vancouver, Canada. And I started teaching myself about the fundamental aspects of photography. Uh, and by that, I mean exposure. I, I mean the, the, the physics of, of light and reflection um, uh, about understanding you know, ISO and shutter speed and, and all these things. And I, I started traveling around British Columbia and taking a lot of really, really bad photos. Um, and some of these photos are actually spread out some so from some trips that I've done before. Um, this was actually 2004 when I went to Australia and New Zealand. Um, and, and these were shot with actually a Kodak uh, 6490 camera. So it's a 4.1 megapixel camera. And to this day, I actually still sell these in calories, which is it's kind of amusing to me. Um, but I think it, it, it serves a good point in the sense that when I first started out, I was developing an eye for composition, and, and I was trying to understand photo editing, and I was trying to understand the business side of things, and, and it was because I, I, I was so bad at the beginning that I really started to, to learn from my mistakes. And so these images that we have here um, were taken over the course um, of those first kind of few years, first few months of, of really getting into uh, ingraining myself in, into photography. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to travel to Australia and New Zealand um, actually prior to moving up to, to Canada. Um, and, and it really got me interested in, in, in photography, not necessarily in understanding that it was a passion of mine, but certainly in understanding that um, I had an interest in it. And it wasn't until I graduated from college, moved up to Vancouver, and, and bought myself a camera that I realized that this was something that I truly loved and I wanted to make it work. So after a few months of teaching myself the basics of, of photography, um, I decided that you know I, I think I really want to go um, travel to Southeast Asia. So I bought a one-way ticket, and um, it was actually on the plane ride over. There was a woman sitting next to me that was from uh, Jacksonville, Wyoming. She was a rock climber and been going out to the Karabi Peninsula in southern Thailand to go climb the amazing limestone cliffs out there, which I, I got to see later. And she fallen in love with a local Thai, uh, a Thai man, and they were getting married. And her friend was a photographer that, that unfortunately had to back out the last second. And uh, I was able to finagle and, and convince her uh, from just a few months of, of doing this um, more seriously um, that she should hire me. And I happened to get the job. And so my first paying photography job ever was shooting a traditional Buddhist wedding in a rural village in the middle of nowhere in southern Thailand. And it was a really eye-opening experience, not only in helping myself build up the confidence in order to approach um, future jobs and, and, and building up my portfolio, uh, but also in showcasing the reality that this fantasy that I had in my head um, could become possible. Um, and, and it really, that was the jump-off point that spurred just about everything else in my career. Um, I can honestly say that if that did not happen, I, I may not be here today. Um, and the point that I bring all this up in is that a lot of people are getting into the industry of photography. They, they, they want to pursue it either as a hobby or maybe they want to do it semi-professionally and have their own job or maybe they want to do it full time. Um, there are always opportunities out there and unless you put yourself out there, unless you're willing to engage others, um, nothing's really going to happen. And I think that's a good point and, and that kind of brings us to the business side of photography. So I wanted to um, uh, Talk a little. These are these are a couple of the images that I shot over that course that I was um, uh, in Canada. Um, and again, this is of course not my best work, but I'm I'm trying to showcase a, a gradual progression of of skill as I was learning. You know, with this image, I, I would sit there on the beaches in Vancouver and shoot the ocean as they were coming in, and that helped teach me about motion and and, and capturing shutter speed and, and the difference and the indirect relationships between all the different variables of exposure. 
Um, you know, this taught me about light and reflection with the uh, railroad, uh, railroad uh, running down the middle and talking about leading lines and again taking bad photos and coming back and being like, why did this photo work and why, are, why do I not find these appealing? Going on, this was this is in Canada. This is in Alberta. Um, you know, with with older cameras, uh, a little bit more noise than, than I would generally like now. But it was, a, it, you know, I had an idea for composition about where I was going. Uh, this is again outside of British Columbia, um, teaching me about water and slow shutter speeds. And so when I started after that job in um, uh, teaching the uh, or doing the wedding in southern Thailand. I started traveling around Southeast Asia for about seven or eight months, and, and these are some of those images that are again leading up to, um, uh, to when I started separating, um, doing this more professionally, to just having it as an interest. So these are Vietnam and, and Bangkok, this is the Grand Palace. And again, this was all teaching myself. I, 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 understand, I understood aspects of photography through books, um, but I did not really truly understand um, you know what my eye was, and I didn't. I hadn't had time to develop my sense of, of my type of work, which happens over time. You know, as you continue to shoot, you realize more and more not only what you like to shoot, but how you shoot. And then once you get into the art of digital editing, um, you also start to pick up different aspects of that. You know, you can look at Brian's photography work, and and you can recognize that this is Brian's. You know, there 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 is certainly something to be said about stepping outside your comfort zone, but. Uh, as, as a generality, there is a thread that connects um, a lot of people's uh, photography portfolios that do this professionally, and that's because we put a piece of ourselves into our work. This is one of my favorite images of, of Southeast Asia. This is actually in Angkor Wat in Cambodia. Um, and this was one of those moments where things just happened. I was walking around. I woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, this was in the, the main temple complex, and I saw this monk walking, and it was like, it was like TV, like everything slowed down, and I just kind of turned and waited for him, and I took about five images, and this was the best one out of them. This was still, this was taken with a Canon XDI, and again, to this day, I still, I actually have this frame next to, next to my computer here in my office, and I sell this um, in, in galleries all over the U.S., um, even with just an XDI. This is a shot underneath some, some of the temple complexes. And so as I was going on and, and, and shooting this type of photography work um, around Southeast Asia, again, I started developing an eye for what I like to shoot. So while I certainly had an affliction for uh, people and culture, which is the travel side of my photography business today, um, I did love landscapes. And I, and I loved showcasing the beauty of, of areas that, that might not have um, been recognized before. Waiting for time and uh, for the time and light to be right, you know, understanding that the golden hours of, of photography truly do matter, um, and, and that shooting in the middle of the day with no clouds just does not work. And and again, because I didn't take a photography class, I had to learn this on my own. And, and I had thousands and thousands and thousands of images that um, were just disappointing to me. Uh, but if I didn't go through that and I didn't learn from that, I I wouldn't be able to improve. Um, so this image is actually of, of Lake Tahoe, California, and I'll use this as a jump-off point to kind of get more into my photography, um, photography business presentation. What I wanted to get through to everyone is that that the business side of photography, as Brian mentioned, is so vitally important. Um, you know, if you go to 500 Pics, if you go to Flickr, um, even if you go to Google Plus, which, as Brian mentioned, is is one of the more popular ones these days, you will see thousands of amazing images. Um, but for the most part, people don't know who these photographers are. Um, these people haven't established themselves as, as, as a brand. Um, they, they don't know how to create income from it. Typically, they, they have other side jobs, and maybe that works for them. But for the most part, one of the biggest questions that I get in a lot of the workshops that I teach is, how can I do this for a living? Um, and that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about today. So the photography industry in general is very romanticized. We all, um, you know, and myself included, looked at this industry at one point where I was like, I, I want to be a National Geographic photographer. Um, and and it's, it's kind of interesting that I've come full circle and, and I've gone through, um, I, want, I don't want to say hardships because I, I do live a fairly fantasy life, but um, I had to learn a lot of these mistakes. Um, and I think looking at the industry with realistic eyes helps you approach the business model in a much, uh, much more efficient, much more effective manner. So today, and Brian, you can tell me uh, tell me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not. 
for the majority of full-time professional photographers, the ones that the guys that are really doing great things out there, if if they are lucky, uh, and, and if we do an amazing job at what we're doing, 85% of the time we are working on building our business. The other the other 15% is almost purely just from uh, it, it, the other 15% is just shooting, and, and that's that's on a good day. You know, most of the time it's actually probably more like 90%, 10%. Um, you know, it's not this globe trotting. We get to travel around and shoot exotic locations uh, 12 months out of the year. Um, in reality, we either get contract jobs or we do freelance pieces and we come back and then we have to make it work. We have to make it be a sustainable type of income. Um, and that's a challenge and that's also a, a bubble that, that gets burst with a lot of photographers getting into the industry where um, they, they have misconceptions of what they think it, it takes to work. Um, one of the biggest aspects of the business side of photography is branding. And, and I think that that goes, uh, goes with if you're a company like On One Software or if you're Colby Brown Photography. And, and there's business, uh, the business model or the idea of developing a business strategy is key to both. Um, and, and I think it's something that is typically overlooked. And unfortunately, um, or, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it, um, you know, it's, it's the side where people have the least amount of education and the least amount of what it is. Everyone can, we can all take these uh, webinars with online software and learn about digital editing. You know, I can sit there and recommend you 15 different books that will um, give you an idea about composition and doing all these different types of pieces. But at the end of the day, if people don't know where to find your work, if, if you're not putting yourself out there um, uh, as far as being available for contracts or doing gallery work or, or finding clients, um, there's, there's not really a point. I mean, you're, you're not going to make anything as a business. Um, and so that kind of brings me into the market. So the photography industry has changed a lot in the last 10 years. And today, I mean, every single day, there are more photographers uh, or wannabe photographers entering a marketplace that has less and less jobs. Um, you know, the micro stock industry has completely almost destroyed macro stock photography. Periodicals are kind of falling off in the sense where landing the cover of Time Magazine no longer gives you a $3,000 paycheck, it's a $15 micro stock purchase. Um, these aren't necessarily good or bad, they are just reality. And, and I think that the quicker the photography industry as a whole, whether it's photographers that have been doing this for 20 years, or people that are just getting in the industry understand these, these concepts, um, the quicker that you can develop a, a much more efficient and effective business model. So National Geographic, again, coming back to that, you know, for myself, it was something that I, I strive for. And, and you know, I, I read the Yellow Magazine as a kid, and, and, and I think most kids, or at least most boys these days that I know, have these dreams of working for National Geographic. And, and as I mentioned, I was very fortunate to be able to have the ability to actually work for them. And they are a phenomenal country, uh, company, and I will definitely work for them again. But in reality, the amount of money that I was paid for three months of work with them was less than what some of my professional photographers that do a single wedding get paid. And this is not to dissuade you from National Geographic by any means, but again to bring you bring everyone back to reality. Um, you know, the the days when National Geographic had 20 staff photographers in, in the early 80s and these guys were globe trotting and doing all these amazing things is, is no longer there. They actually have one staff photographer left and everyone else is independent contractors. And, and as everyone listening, I'm imagining that you guys are interested in the business side of photography. You guys want to do this as a living or want to make income doing it. So it's, it's a good point to take in. Um, you know, there are multiple sources of income for photography. And um, I, I think it's key to develop strategies that work for your different client bases. So the main sources um, for income, you have stock photography, which I mentioned has dropped off, but it's still not, um, it's not impossible to make money for it. Actually, our, uh, me and Brian's good friend, Nicole Young, actually does quite well with it. You also have print sales that you can either do through an online store, either by your creation or a company like Smug Mug or, or something like that. Um, you can also sell prints through an, an art gallery, which typically they take a, a decent sized portion from. Usually it's, it's 40 to 60 percent of the sale. And you also have to cover the cost of printing and framing. You have contract work, as I mentioned, like the National Geographic piece, um, uh, which is great. And, and, and sometimes you can combine those together. And then you have photo education, which is something that Brian does and myself does and a handful of other uh, photo educators out there do because of the influx of people that are um, teaching or influx of people that are interested in the aspects of photography. 
So taking all those into account, I think it's very important to think about developing a business strategy and a business model. And, and the questions that you have to ask yourself, I think the number one, number one question is, you know, what do you enjoy doing? And, and for me, that was not such an easy question. I mean, as Brian mentioned, I'm, I'm kind of a, a jack of all, a jack of all trades, but a master of none. And I think that's actually pretty accurate. You know, I really enjoy nature and landscape photography. Um, it's certainly where my passion is. But I also really enjoy traveling uh, and documenting different cultures. And I also really enjoy doing aspects of my humanitarian work when I am on on contract or when I'm on assignment out around the world. Um, by not specializing, um, you know, there are pros and cons in order to in expanding your repertoire, so to speak, as far as what you offer. Um, but if you look at other photographers that just do studio work, they're just concentrating on a single market segment. And that sometimes makes it easy to develop a business strategy. Um, for me, this works because um, I'm not a person that likes to settle in life. So, you know, I, I love pursuing these different types of passions and, and making it all work. Um, but I think that's a very vital, important question to ask. You know, do I want to shoot wedding photography? Do I want to uh, travel and, and shoot nature landscape? You know, how does that work with my life? Do, do I have a wife? Do I have kids? Is, is that reasonable? I think the second question that is very good to ask yourself is, you know, what is your audience? What, what are your clients? What do you want to try to go after? You know, if you shoot studios or weddings, then it's finding people that can either shoot portraits or that you can shoot engagements and shoot their weddings. For nature landscape, that's a little bit different. I mean, we're, I, I don't want to um, degrade the work that we do, but, you know, nature landscape photography is a very saturated market. And, you know, there's a lot of photographers out there doing amazing work. I mean, looking at this image that I just put up there, this is an HDR image of um, one of the geysers, Morning Glory Geyser in Yellowstone National Park. You know, how many images, if you actually searched up Morning Glory Geyser in Google Images, would you find? And my best, my, my best guess is probably millions. Um, so in establishing yourself um, for what audience you're trying to go after is important. You know, am I taking this image and I'm actually going to go after putting my work up into an art gallery? Am I just trying to sell it online? Um, for me, myself, it's typically a, con a mixture of everything. Uh, which comes back to a, a balanced business approach, um, which I'll mention in two seconds. Um, I think the next good step is to actually make a five-year plan. And, and I tell this to a lot of students of mine. Um, and the idea in developing a five-year plan is that you start to begin to develop a loose structure for where you would like to be. Um, and you don't necessarily have to, to develop this um, completely detailed plan of every single little thing you're going to do. But if you start at the end and you start, hey, in five years, you know, um, for myself, I want to teach X number of workshops or, or I want to work for whatever company it is, it allows you to work backwards and, and think logically about the steps that it's going to require in order to get to where you need to go. Um, you know, whether that, you know, whether that be engaging more in social marketing, whether that, that is uh, important to build up more of a portfolio. Um, these different, these three key aspects um, are, are vitally important to figuring out which direction you want to go. And, and I see a lot of photographers that are kind of wandering around aimlessly around the photo industry. You know, they like to take photos. They don't necessarily know where they want to concentrate on. They, just, they don't know necessarily how to price their work. They don't necessarily know how to get their name out there. They don't know what it takes in order to get publications. Um, and, and there's a lot of information and sources online that you can find a lot of these a lot of the answers to these questions, but um, if, if you're not asking them, then you're never going to find the find the answers. And, and I think that that's a, a vital um, vital aspect of, of developing a business model. Uh, and I can go into developing a business model, market strategy, um, for an entire webinar, probably for an eight-hour or ten-hour course. Um, but for now, we'll, we'll kind of move on um, a little bit. So. With all those different types of sources of income, um, I think it's also vitally important in order to make sure that you are not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, the one thing that I've learned over the years of doing this as a freelance photographer, and by that I mean work for myself, is that the photography industry is volatile in the sense of consistency. Um, you know, Brian, uh, Brian used to do photography, uh, still does it professionally, but used to do it fully on his own. Um, and, and definitely knows the challenges that it brings about in finding contract work and the lack of consistency and, and never knowing, you know, some months if it, you make more than, you know, uh, people that are uh, full-time accounting partners and then some months if it sounds, you know, feels like you're in college and you're eating top ramen again. Um, 
it, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. The reason that I mentioned not putting all your eggs in one basket is that there are multiple sources of income that you can get from being a photographer. And those sources of income have changed, as I mentioned, with the, the changing market. Um, stock photography, to selling of prints, to doing contract work, to maybe stepping into photo education if you've done that before, if you've, as far as being an educator. Um, the, there, there are no longer these giant river streams of revenue in order to survive as a photographer. Um, there are lots of smaller tributaries that feed into um, a, a nice source of, of income if you structure things correctly. And I think that's a very important aspect to, to understand. You know, I, I do a lot of photo education. It's probably, you know, 40% of, of my income, maybe maybe more, and it's probably larger than the other other variables. Um, so I definitely have an emphasis on that in my business strategy, but I don't rely on it solely. And, and I think that's a, again a key key aspect of things. Um, diversify, find balance, figure out where your strengths are, and specifically know what your weaknesses are, and, and try to get around those. Um, figuring out solutions to problems. You know, I want to get into being a landscape and nature photographer, but I don't have a portfolio. Or you know, I want to get into weddings, but I haven't developed any clients. Well, if you start asking these questions and you really start dissecting them, I promise you that nine times out of ten, you probably actually already have the answer. You just haven't really been looking hard enough. Um, so don't put all of your emphasis onto any one of those things. Play around with them. Figure out what might work for you depending on your audience, depending on your, your business strategy, um, and then go from there. And, and it's going to be a changing... Um, you know, it's a it's a dynamic market and it's a dynamic industry. And and working for yourself as an entrepreneur is is something that changes every day. And that's for me. That's why I love it. I love the fact that every day I don't do the same thing. Um, but within that context, you definitely have to understand that you can't. You know, I can't spend five months just doing one one specific thing because I neglect my other sources of income. So it definitely comes down to balance and time management. Um, from there, I, I think it's actually a good jumping point to go into social marketing. Um, and, and, you know, Brian mentioned that me and him met on, on Google Plus, and I think we both kind of came across each other um, on, on Twitter, uh, or maybe it was uh, Facebook or something like that beforehand, but we never actually spoke. Um, and so there's, there's huge benefits in, in having an online presence, uh, both in collaborating and, and building up a customer and client base. Um, and, and building up branding, which I think is important. And for me, social marketing is all about building up a digital platform. And the idea behind that is that the more followers that you have, the more people that follow you on Twitter, or the more people that care about what you post on Flickr, or the more people that you have around Facebook or, um, uh, or Google+, Plus have a significance in the sense that, that marketing, as far as business goes, is a numbers game. And the higher you build your platform, uh, the more people you reach. And while numbers definitely can be equated to, to egotistical aspects of, of our industry, um, in general, they, they still have a significance. I mean, currently, in 38 days, I've amassed uh, 11,300 or around so um, people that have circled me in Google+. And, and you know, that's a decent sized number. It's important not in the sense that these people love my photography work, but in the sense that when I push information out, when I share other photos, when I talk about collaborative projects uh, that I'm doing with Brian or Onwood Software, I have more of a voice to be heard. And, and I think that that's a struggle that a lot of starting photographers feel when they join, join social networks. Um, you know, you have people that have established themselves and, and you have to work hard in order to engage. Um, for that, I, I kind of want to start talking about Google+, Plus, but before that, actually, let, let's talk a little bit about um, the different social networks out there. So currently, the main pieces that you have, uh, the main players in the game, is Facebook, you have Flickr, you have Twitter, you have 500 picks, and you have Google+. Plus. There, there's certainly a, a few other fringe ones. There's one X and a handful of other ones, but I think these are the main ones where you have the most amount of traffic or the most amount of people going in. Each one of these have benefits, and each one of them also have downfalls. Um, and, and as a person that runs my own business, I have to prioritize and manage my time with the social networks that provide the most benefit to my, my company. 
um, you know, uh, as Brian said, it's, it's not, you don't want to say it's all about money, but at the end of the day, you also need to put food on the table. Um, for me, I also have a family, I have a wife and a kid on the way, and, and it's important in order to, to maximize the time and make sure that what I'm doing is not being wasteful. So with each of these different social networks, you have different ways in which you can connect with clients or with other photographers, with companies, um, uh, or, or just share information and, and, and you can, you know, possibly get print sales and different pieces from that. Um, Facebook has been established. It has 750 million people that are on it right now. Um, it is a, a solid bet in the sense that there's a lot of individuals there. Um, for me personally, I have, I've actually found that Facebook has felt much more like a, a closed club, so to speak. You know, when, when, when Facebook first came about through uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, uh, and Harvard, the idea that it was just for universities and it slowly spread out, but I think a lot of what it's done over the years, which has been very beneficial for, for social aspects, uh, social media in general, um, has maintained that idea that it's kind of a closed club. I, I create a business page on there, and then it's kind of uh, it feels like I'm ice skating uphill in order to bring followers to it. You know, it, it's not as easy in order to engage people. Um, and, and from my experience, um, those engagements seem to be seem to be far less than some of the other options out there. Um, that brings us to Twitter. So Twitter is a phenomenal tool in order to share information in real time, um, whether that's just a thought, whether that's a photo that you took that day, whether it's a, a webinar that you're teaching for On One Software uh, about the business strategies for, for the photography industry, um, whatever it is, it, it's a great tool. You are, however, limited in the amount of interactions that you have. So you have a 140 character uh, limit. You um, everything still feels very digital, and it still feels you know you have these short text you know text message conversations. Um, it, it's good for instant communication, but I, I felt that it was always kind of lacking a little bit in trying to explain more about something. I, I'd love to share an image on there and talk more about you know how I created the image or what it was like instead of you know having 140 characters, which just means I can say this is a shot of maroon bells in Colorado, you know. Uh, in uh, Maroon Bells, Aspen, Colorado, and here's a link. Um, and so I've always felt that it was limiting. Then you have sites like Flickr and 500 Picks. And, and Flickr and 500 Picks are, are very beneficial in, in some respects and um, are very superficial in others. And it is an interesting mix to see photographers that have been very successful with, with 500 uh, Picks and with Flickr. And, and those that haven't. So I know a handful of guys um, that actually make a decent amount of money through the connections they make on 500 pigs or, or Flickr by uh, sharing their images by making print sales and doing different pieces. Um, I personally have found a lot of those websites to be, you know, very much pat on the back. It actually reminds me a lot of when I first started um, my photography uh, career and, and the person that I was sharing most of my work with was uh, my family and friends. And as I'm sharing work with them, uh, basically all I was getting told was that my work is great. And I knew that there were problems with these images and I was looking for constructive feedback and I just wasn't getting it. Um, and while you could certainly get some of that aspect of, of constructive criticism with, with um, Flickr groups and with different pieces, um, for the most part, I post an image out there and everyone says it's a great image and it gets shared a couple thousand times and it's great. Um, but for my business strategy, for what I do to either fill workshops or make print sales, I found them um, to, to not be so beneficial for me. And again, this is just my own opinion. Um, many other photographers actually find quite uh, quite a great reception with their work. They fill a lot of workshops. They make a lot of print sales. Um, but for me, that's kind of where it's become. It, it almost seems like it's a very superficial aspect of, of the photography industry. You know, we all love pretty photos. We all like sharing our work. Um, but I only can, you know, only need to hear that one of my images is, is good for, you know, ten times, and then after that, it, it just becomes repetitious, and um, I don't see too much benefit out of it. Um, I want to use that as actually for a into Google Plus. So as um, Brian mentioned, Google Plus is is the hot kid on the block. It's, um, you know, it's very it's exciting because it's new and because there's new features um, that you don't necessarily get everywhere else. Um, but it's also become an amazing tool for my photography business and, and for the photography industry as whole, who I think is taking a very very good liking um, uh, to Google Plus. So Google Plus is 
different from the other social networks out there in the sense that you have such a higher level of interaction than you can get anywhere else. Um, and, and this is not just necessarily my opinion. I, th I think Brian would agree that there are more ways to engage in meaningful, uh, meaningful ways. There are, there are more ways to have personable interactions um, than ever before. Uh, and when you mix that with a very clean interface, when you mix that with, um, you know, uh, the ability to do video conferencing hangouts with up to 10 people, to do uh, Google Plus huddles with, you know, hundreds of, of, of people in chat rooms, um, and you have the ability to share media and, uh, you know, share your photography work and do different types of things, I think is, is very exciting, and it's something that I kind of jumped on. And I actually want to take a break from showcasing some of these images, um, and you guys can, Brian, you can let me know if you guys see everything. Uh, I want to switch over to this guy that I put together. And so this is something that I wrote, um, and then, Brian, can you guys see this? Okay. So this is a guide that, that I wrote um, uh, back in, uh, back in July, um, and it was, it was right as Google Plus came out, which is um, around the 30th, I believe, of, of June. And I saw that there was a, a big benefit to the photography industry and the photography community, and so I spent a lot of hours and a lot of days, um, this was actually shortly after me and Brian met, I kind of went incognito for a few days and, and, and just kind of huddled in, in my room and did a lot of research and um, you know, put together a pretty extensive piece of um, uh, literature based on understanding how it works and I think that I think that delving into a new market like Google Plus is uh, something that that shouldn't be overlooked and, and I know that many of you here might already be on Google Plus so I might be repetitious for this and I apologize but I think that building out a branding in a social uh, for social marketing is so vitally important and, and taking advantage of the new ones that come along um, uh, are are vital to, to building your business, to building your brand, to getting your name out there. Um, if you guys get a chance, and, and I'm actually going to go ahead and put this link in the chat box here, so you guys can follow along if you want. And it is oh, one second. Let's see here. There we go. And you guys should be able to see that now. Um, and so if you get a chance and you're a little bit worried about Google+, Plus, please give this a look over. I'm not trying to promote my own website or anything like that. It's just a good source of information to understand the differences, um, how circles work, and, and how you can, you can have complete control over your privacy. Um, it's not like Facebook where you have to have you know, five different pages and all these different um, you know, profiles in order to actually inter engage with multiple different types of people, whether it's your family or your coworkers or things like that. Um, there's some really, really great tools. Um, and, and Brian actually did a really, really good job of, uh, he, he wrote a piece the other day that um, was partly inspired by something that I, that I wrote, but I think he did it much more elegantly, um, talking about engaging in social, social marketing uh, and social networking. And, and this stems not only from your blog, but also to the different aspects of what you use, whether it's Flickr, Twitter, 500 Picks, um, or, or Google+. Plus. And I think one of the most important aspects of what he mentioned was consistency and, and consistently sharing quality work, consistently sharing, um, you know, good aspects of, uh, you know, the photo industry, consistently having a presence, I think, is key. Um, you know, I, I think that if you join a social network and you engage it for, for two weeks and then you take three months off, you know, uh, what typically happens? Um, you know, it becomes stagnant. Not many people are listening to your voice anymore. When you do come back, it, it's much harder. And, and I think that that's, um, I think it's an important lesson to learn in developing a strategy in order how to engage. Um, for me, because of photo education, this was a natural piece. I, I wanted to write this guide. This is an educational idea of how to engage. It was a very unique aspect, uh, or very unique piece that I put together that I didn't see out there, um, which kind of brings us to the point of original content, you know, if you go onto some of these social networks and you see people sharing other people's work, um, 
most most people on these networks um, will not follow you or not follow your, your work because you're not engaging in unique and creative ways. You are not providing content that they can't find anywhere else, um, which is a great rule to actually understand for your own photography work. If someone can get your work exactly as it is from someone else that does it cheaper or for free, um, you know, why are they going to buy from you? And that's the same mentality that you should take with, with social networking and developing a strategy for engaging with individuals. Um, I, th I think, again, it comes down to a balance. I'm always about balanced approach, whether it becomes with my photography work, or whether it becomes on, on my business practice, or where it becomes on my social marketing strategy. It needs to be a little bit of a, a mixture of things in order to make it work. So I've, able to I've been able to develop a pretty decent sized following, and I think last I checked, I was the, the sixth most circled photographer on, on Google+, um, which again is not about ego, but specifically about building that platform. Um, and I've been able to do that by engaging people in meaningful ways. So Google Plus has um, has these Hangouts that are very um, very unique to the to the uh, social media and social networking circles. And let me scroll down a little bit here. Let's talk about circles and, and managing the people that you're following. Uh, and I think there's actually, if I remember correctly, there's a great picture of Brian. If you guys have never seen, <laughs> photo. I was waiting for that. It's actually a beautiful one. So, there it so this is. Is, these are Hangouts. Um, and so, uh, you know, Hangouts are, are video chats that, group video chats that, that um, allow you to have up to 10 people in a single room talking, um, sharing webcams, uh, and obviously voice. And you don't necessarily have to have a webcam or a, um, or a microphone in order to engage, because there's a small chat window, but I, I definitely think it's, it's important. Um, but these specifically, there's Brian. Look at that guy. He's pretty. Um, but you can see there's a chat program on the left, and and underneath you have you have all the thumbnails. And, and the reason that I bring up um, the Hangouts is is that it is one of the most unique and creative ways in order to collaborate. So um, for myself, I've been able to establish a small group of other professional photographers that I, I talk to on a regular basis. And, and because I work from home. Um, it actually has given me the ability to feel like I'm working in an office mentality. And, and by that I mean, you know, well, I certainly don't want to work in a cubicle ever, probably. Um, you know, being able to connect with other individuals, with other people that share your passions, I think is huge. Um, and for me personally, just the collaborative app, uh, effort of, of what it's allowed me to do with my business in connecting with On One Software, who I, I, I again met Brian through Google Plus to connecting with other photographers like Scott Jarvie, who's a phenomenal wedding photographer and does travel photography work that I think all three of us are going to teach a workshop in Bolivia next year, to someone like Nicole Young, who's a phenomenal food photographer um, that actually just came out with a book. It's a good little plug for her. Um, to all these different types of people that I've been able to collaborate with that I haven't, that, that I might have connected with on other organizations, but I haven't been able to connect with them in a meaningful enough way in order to have that personable experience in order for, you know, me and Brian can share tweets back and forth, but does that really get him to know who I am? Um, and I think the, the, the answer is no. Um, so Hangouts are, are, are a huge aspect of, um, of Google+. Plus. Um, the rest of, of the reason why I think Google+, Plus is taking off and why I think everyone uh, needs to be on there is because of the meeting sh uh, media sharing. Um, and as you can see from the screenshot, which is just, I think, talking actually more about Hubble's, um, is, is that there's this massive stream of information that goes uh, directly down the middle of, uh, of, of your, your main website, your main page for uh, Google+. And through this, you can, uh, you can engage with individuals. You can tag them in photos. It, it's, you know, it's really amazing what Google Plus, Google's been able to do with Google+, in the sense of merging some of the best aspects of Twitter uh, and Facebook with tagging. Uh, to the media sharing aspects, to having a very clean UI, to having images that are presented in, in really beautiful ways. Um, and I think I can find a photo here. So, so this is one of the photos of, uh, this is one of the photo sections. So you have an ability to click on a photo section and showcase all of the most recently updated images from some of your followers. Um, and you can see it's presented really, it's, it's beautiful light boxes and, and thumbnails that really allow for you to have a very unique and um, engaging way in order to share your work, in order to collaborate and to do different types of, of pieces. Um, so I, I don't want to focus too much on, on this, um, uh, the Google Plus survival guide that I wrote, but check it out if you haven't before. I, I think it's really important. 
Um, and I think that if you aren't on it, you're you're kind of missing out on um, collaborating and connecting with clients and on doing different types of things. For me personally, and I think for Brian as well, um, you know, I've been able to fill workshops, I've been able to sell prints, I've been able to connect with organizations like On One um, and do a handful of other different things, and including spread out my name and, and building out a a brand recognition for myself with Google Plus that is a part of a larger strategy with all my other social networks um, that really has um, helped my business in more ways than I ever really imagined on the day that Google Plus was announced. So, um, you know, with that, I, I highly recommend everyone giving it a try and, um, you know, seeing, seeing what happens from it. I mean, that's, again, the biggest thing that it comes down to is if you are not putting your work out there, and by that I mean, you know, either social networking or doing local marketing, if you don't, um, you know, submit your images to magazines in order to to get publications, and then you ask the question, why am I not getting publications? You already you already know the answer to that, and, and the reason is because you're not getting yourself out there. Um, you know, I I, th I think that maybe that's a good pausing point, maybe to see if we have any questions or uh, whatnot if people want to engage. Sure. Let me. Uh, actually, I haven't. I, I didn't want to even. I wasn't looking at the questions module because I was. You were on quite the roll, and I was really uh, happy yeah. with the with the cadence of your of your presentation. So I'm just gonna bring up the questions module now and take a look at what we got. I'm sure we've got a oh yeah, we've got a doozy. <laughs> um, so there are a few people, and I was expecting this. Um, a few people bringing up that Google Plus is still um, kind of in trial in terms of you don't just go there like in Facebook and, and set up an account. Right. With that, uh, Google did allow us, all, everyone who has an account, to uh, invite up to 150 people. No, 500 right. or 150? No, it's 150 100, people. Yeah. And they also they have a, they give you the ability to invite people through links. So anyone that's listening, if you guys do want to try out Google+, Plus, um, you can actually go to my blog, which is this on the same link that I shared. And on the right-hand side in the sidebar, there's a picture, uh, there's an icon for Google+. Plus. Right underneath that, there's a hypertext link um, that you can just click on that. You'll automatically have an invite. I, last I checked, I have 100 invites left. I put it on there yesterday, so it's been going pretty quick. But... If you need an invite, you can just go to my website and, and pull one off of my, my blog sidebar. Absolutely. And um, to that point also, we uh, with On One, we launched a contest today um, yeah. that um, part of the component, one of your entries is on Google+. And exactly like Colby said, if you go to the On One software blog, which I can link you to at the end, um, I put a link to my Google+, Plus invite link. So that's another 150. So, you know, we should be good to go there. Um, Derek asked a good question. Um and he asked, uh, you know, how did you stay afloat when you were first starting your business? That's it's definitely a good question. Um, as I mentioned, I had saved up enough money um, in order to not have to do anything else. Um, I, I want to say that the majority of people getting into the industry typically have another job that they're doing until they're able to stand on their own two feet. And um, that's just kind of the nature of the changing industry again. Um, even with you know, landing some of the dream jobs that I had, I, you know, at times it was still a struggle. Um, and, and like I said, mostly it was because I was learning from my own mistakes, because I was learning the business side of, of the photography industry in general as I was doing things or as I wasn't doing things and realizing, you know, hey, um, you know, I'm not getting published. Why am I not getting published? Because I'm not really searching out for it. Um, you know, there are ways that you can make a living for yourself um, when you're first starting out doing different types of photography, but again, it depends on, on what type of, um, what genres you want to get into. You know, doing weddings, wedding photography, you can easily, um, you know, build up a small, small um, portfolio of, of some of your best portrait work and then approach some local photographers and try to become a second shooter at weddings, which will give you anywhere from 200 to $800 a wedding. Um, if you're doing nature landscapes, you can be you can mentor someone and, and learn as you have another side job and get to yourself to a, a correct level. But for myself, I was fortunate in the sense that I had saved up quite a bit of money, mostly by selling just about everything that I had before I moved up to Vancouver, Canada, um, and then being able to support my mistakes until I was able actually to, to get myself on my own two feet. Cool. Yeah. I mean, it's funny uh, when you were. Uh, mentioning about you know just the the need to like you, you 
it's the business will not come to you and uh uh, I remember in, in 2001, 2002, shortly after the bombings in, of the World Trade Center, um, I, I lost my job. I was in the tech industry, and, you know, it's not like the jobs... First of all, the, the tech industry was ruined at that point. The bubble burst, and uh, and the, the terrorist attack didn't make it any easier. And so I was living in New York City, and um, I remember going from... Uh, I would put on a suit. It was I, mean, I was no different than anyone else um, in terms of putting up, put on a suit, print out a bunch of CVs or resumes, and go and go from uh, office to office and just drop it off. Um, and the same thing, the same exact practice occurred when I was transitioning to becoming a commercial photographer, um, which was uh, was really going well in terms of. First of all, you need to you need to figure out what you what you're good at and what you want to do and then secondly so like I wanted to do commercial photography I wanted to shoot for hotels and restaurants and so I jockeyed and I would go to first the restaurants are, are a wonderful thing because they open and close like um, a door um, and a new restaurant opens well they need a website they need a presence and the presence is photo, they, photos photos of food photos of the restaurant itself make it appealing want people to come in and eat um, so you go in there, you have a, your book, and you show it to them. You show, you know, you say that you're starting out. You're honest with them, and uh, you do what you need to do to to get your clientele. And Colby, I'm going to ask you a question, and uh, you know, tell me about the significance about saying no. I think it's very important. Actually, it's a it's a good good piece that I should have brought up earlier. Um, you know, I, I think most photographers, when you're starting out, have a inkling that you need to do things for free in order to either build up a client base or in order to uh, build up a portfolio. And I think that I think it's very hard. And it, it's of course much easier for us that have kind of gone through it um, than it is for someone that's that's right there. And then you know it's hard to approach someone and say, hey, I want to do you know uh, hire me for this job. I you know I can shoot this wedding or I can shoot your engagement or, um, you know, I want to have a gallery showing and, and you don't necessarily have, um, you know, the, the work for it just yet or whatnot. But I think it's vitally important for you to understand that you do not need to take every single job that comes out there. Um, if by job I don't, you know, not, they're not always paying, obviously. There's there's sometimes the promise of you'll get accreditation for it or, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll give you links or maybe the next job will pay you, you know. They're, they're, People will do all sorts of things in order to swindle you out of your service. Um, and I think that it is a good lesson to learn that you need to put your foot down. And even when you're starting out and you're trying to build a portfolio, some level of, ex of exchange, some level of value for your work will make it ten times easier for you to climb the business ladder for your, you know, for your business than it would be if you started doing things free. Um, I actually had a great hangout with Ken Kamineski, who's a phenomenal travel photographer, um, does work that is, uh, you know, on par with the high quality stuff that Brian does with some of his HDR stuff um, yesterday, and, and he's really big on photographer rights and, and on, you know, business practices, and, you know, he mentioned yesterday that if you, as soon as you start doing work for free, you will always be the free person, and I think that's a good, good lesson. Um, you know, for your clients, you get approached by someone, and they, you know, I say, hey, mate, next job will pay you, whatever it is, and you say, okay, I'll do it for free. Well, for that, in that person's mind, you are always that go-to guy. You are that free person. Every once in a while, you might get lucky, and maybe they will pay you on the next gig or something like that, but nine times out of ten, they will not. And, and I think that having a value for your work at some level, um, some level of value when you're first starting out is vitally important in order for you to understand, um, you know, the importance of um, effectively valuing um, both your time, your services, and your products. Um, it's much easier to work backwards and be like, hey, um, you know, even though you're starting out, it's $100 for me to shoot this this engagement photo. But today, you know, for this month, I have a 50% off special. That allows you to backtrack a little bit and have a little bit more reason, reasonable price, even though you don't have a full portfolio built out. But it gives you a good starting point so that you can easily go back up to 100 and get, you know, go higher from there rather than saying, hey, I will do this for free for you. Right. And uh, you brought up a good point, Colby, earlier in this respect, um, and it was it kind of touches on a question that was asked. Let me see by who, um, by Keith. In terms of um, whenever it's about double dipping or triple dipping, um, 
when Kobe travels, if it's on assignment, and he has an opportunity to shoot something that may be um, more humanitarian or landscape, because he's there, he does it. And in that respect, you're building up um, these different, you know, uh, portfolio pieces, ideally, that are strong um, through, uh, yeah, uh, uh, when I would go uh, traveling somewhere, like when I went to Montreal last year, I reached out to the um, Westing group who I'd worked with, and I was like, well, I'm, I was going on vacation, actually, and uh, I was staying there of all places, um, and uh, I just said, hey, do you, can, I'm available, do you want uh, to spruce up your the images, and, um, and it just worked out nicely, so it was kind of like a double dip vacation plus I got a little gig out of it um, and I, I also want to kind of this is an editorial comment on, on the whole marketing of things and I could probably catch a lot of flack for this and Colby you can agree or disagree with me um, if you're in it for a business it's not necessarily it does not necessarily be behoove you to, to announce every little win and every little sale um, as a wedding photographer for instance I think it's fantastic after you've already gotten the gig to display a blog post of some of the images from there because that will attract that that is your portfolio it's tangible as a wedding photographer I think it's very tacky when someone says hey I just booked another wedding um, that's almost something you should I see that and I'm like okay uh, that's something you should be doing um, when I you know very few of my friends know the specifics of my commercial uh, business because I always thought talking about business was somewhat taboo um, I never talked about how much I made. I never really even uh, spent too much time showing too many of my images because I wanted it to be very niche. Um, I wanted it to be a, a very, very kind of boutique, high-end uh, product, and it was. Um, now, I'm totally thankful that On One came along because it gave me an opportunity to be a photographer on my own terms. But, Colby, tell me your thoughts about that because I see this a lot on social media. People are like, hey, I just got a check from Getty. It's like, well... I would ask Nicole, is that something you would often times, who's, Nick, Nicole is a microstock photographer and, and super successful, Nicole Young, and um, I don't think I've ever seen her say, yep, got another check from Getty. Um, right. So I guess, Colby, before you answer, um, my point is be cognizant of the persona, um, uh, of the quality of your persona that you put out there in, in the social media network. Um, if, no, I, I definitely agree. I mean, I think that I think that the, the key to what you're saying, or maybe the differentiation of um, of being arrogant and being uh, a competent business person, I think, is is, is a, a fine line to dance. You know, I, I personally wouldn't sit there and be like, "Hey, I just landed a you know ten thousand dollar contract with the the you know city of, of Colorado or I any mean, city of, of Denver," um, but I would utilize you know the 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 jobs that I have had or am having in order to secure more jobs. I mean, that's the whole idea. I mean, again, for for me personally, print sales and, and gallery work certainly are a source of income, but they are not a high source of income. And, and the value of a specific single image anymore these days, it, in my opinion, is pretty low um, compared to at least how they may have been um, 15 or 20 years Let ago. me jump in on that point, Colby, because you, you exactly – you thank you for saying that. You said it. the 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 cost of a sale of a print, forget about micro stock, which is infinitesimally lower, um, is low. If you know that, Kobe, yeah. most other photographers know that too. So when you are promoting yourself and you're saying, "I sold a print," I see someone gave you twenty dollars, or someone yeah. gave you fifty dollars, um, and to me that is just not some. That is not the type of um, brand that no. I ever want. No, definitely. Yeah, you devalue yourself. I mean, again, that's the, you know, whether it's stock or, or whether it's a contract job or whatever it is, I mean, you should be, you should always be actively and, and, and personally engaging in letting people know about your business. But, you know, there's a tactful way to do it, and there's a way that ultimately devalues your, your product and your service. And I think, you know, by saying specific things or doing things in a specific way, as you mentioned, whether it's like, oh, I just got another... Um, you know, I just got, I just landed another uh, wedding, or I, I just, you know, got a check from Getty for my microstock images for 50 bucks, whatever it is. You know, that's not engaging in a meaningful way. That is not um, building up your brand in a sense of, you know, 
hearing someone else that get that made you know fifty dollars from Microstock is does not make me uh, impressed. And 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 I think that you know as a client, as a lover of art myself, I mean every country I go to, I I, I buy a piece of art from a local artist, and my house is me and my wife's house is decorated with it all over the place. Um, I understand the value in other people's work, and and if you, again it comes down to the idea that if you're if you devalue your work from the get go, um, or, or or do do instances as far as negative branding that sticks with you, and and we at least inside the photography industry, as big as it is as far as your numbers, we're we're close knit community, you know, and and I think Brian will also tell you, you know, there's there's a photographer out there that that does things a specific way, and it's in a negative connotation. Um, that person gets gets labeled that, and then that follows you. And depending again on your business model, if if it has anything to do with actually finding clients within the photography industry, that that hurts you. You know, I, I don't I would you know I don't want to buy prints or want to do you know want to care if another photographer uh, lands a job. But if you know Scott Jarvey gets a, a new wedding and showcases some of the work and it's in part of an educational piece or showcasing what he's doing, it's awesome. It's showcasing what he's up to, but not it has to be in a meaningful way. I guess is my point. Beautifully put. Agreed, one hundred percent. Um, and that I think is, is what separates um, the few from the many uh, is that understanding uh, the, the quality behind how you present yourself and on, I'm, I, I just want to close it out with just one thought and I, I want to give you the, the final uh, kind of retort and I've said this before and I think it's a problem um, I think a lot of photographers um, care too much about what other photographers think they uh, they play to the the other photographers on social media and that's great if you're learning to grow as long as you're playing to the right photographers um, I always try to uh, I, I, I think it's um, one of the most attractive qualities of crit criticism is when it comes from someone who is who I know is who I feel is just superior um, and that's kind of what you need to do uh, you need to break out of hey what does my friend think about my image and more about find someone who you respect Ask them if they're willing to spend some time, uh, you know, and be reasonable, and uh, be tactful, and ask. And that's that I, I think with with Google Plus is um, is uh, one of the most amazing things. The fact that like I've had hangouts with you know Zach Arias and and, and uh, uh, Trey Ratcliffe and RC Concepcion and the people at 500 Picks and you know Colby, you too, um, and and people who I you know immensely respect their pillars in the industry now these are the next generation of photographers whether you like it or not these are the people who are making names for themselves to carry the next 20 30 years um because there it is a very generational thing so um blog posts and comments and all this stuff is is static it's it's important because it builds consistency in your brand but um when you're looking to grow and you're looking for for advice i think and tell me if you disagree colby but like be selective and um and, and don't pay attention necessarily to to the masses pay attention to the people learn to 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 know who you need to know and start from there for sure for sure no i i 100 percent agree and, and i think the only thing that i would necessarily add to that is that you know uh my comments on 500 picks and Flickr uh, were not necessarily meant to be negative towards those because I think that photographers, especially ones starting out, have a feeling of um, inadequacy and and of not wanting to ask questions that that you know might have been actually important questions to ask. They they feel that they're stupid questions or whatnot. So I think that building up, figuring out ways to build up your confidence as an artist, I think is important. But I think Brian hit the, the nail on the head in the sense that, you know, you don't necessarily want to take photography advice from just about anyone, and that's not necessarily a, I'm not trying to make that sound egotistical, it's just the sense that, you know, you want to find find outlets in order for you to, to get feedback from your work in order to better yourself. And, and from my experience, again, when I was going with my friends and family, is that I, and to this day, I still, my friends and family still don't tell me there's anything wrong with my images. And and while I certainly have feel that I've improved as a photographer, I know that there are things that I can continue to improve on. Um, and so finding a a nice group of individuals and, and forming your own little 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 group, I think, definitely helps. I mean, like I said, like I mentioned with those photographers, whether it's Scott Jarvey, uh, whether it's Brian, uh, whether it's Nicole Young, you know, that's a small that's my small small uh, professional clique, so to speak, in the sense that I bounce my images off those guys and, and you know want to you know want to get feedback. I want to know what they think. I, you know, I'm still learning. We're all learning, no matter 
if someone thinks, you know, Ansel Adams, if he was still alive, would be learning today. And I think that's a key key element of things, you know. But, but certainly finding a, a group mentality or, or finding a way in order for you to, um, you know, search out to people that you admire and, and having conversations with them and asking. And again, the Google Plus is, is beneficial in the sense that you have more direct access to some of the best minds in the industry in order to do that. So, you know, you can contact Brian, you can contact myself, you can talk, contact other other guys on Google Plus and be like, hey, you know, would you mind spending a few minutes with me and walking me through this image? Would you mind giving me a photo critique? And the majority of the time, we're, we're more than willing to do it. I mean, we're, we're busy people and, and sometimes it takes us a while, but we're here for we're here to help the industry. That's that's what we love. That's why we're educators. So definitely take advantage of that as best you can. Well put. Well put, Colby. You know, uh, to to close it out. Um, I I think it's great, and I think the the times that we have done these kind of I love the critiques that we've done. Um, uh, with with general public, you know, and um, and and the thing you have to understand is, um, you really can't have a soft skin on this. I'm not, and Colby, I, I don't. I'm not in it to, to 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 say yeah you know that's a good shot if, if it's you know my 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 buddy Dave who uh who who's you know also kind of a close hangout friend you know he sends images and I mean they're just I tell him straight up and uh, and he appreciates it because if you come back and you say yeah well yeah but yeah but forget it you've lost me I don't have patience for it I'm sorry I know it sounds arrogant and uh, and conceited and maybe it is but um. It's not like I've been shooting for a year or two. I've been shooting for a really long time, and and it only was for the past year or two where I kind of understood the significance of that. That you know what, it's okay to kind of um, tell myself that I'm a strong photographer. Um, that when someone asks me, "Are you a photographer?" or "What do you do?" I say, "I'm a photographer," and I stand by that um, through and through. Uh, 